Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Configuration Best Practices, NetApp Clustered on Tap and Veritas Net Backup and DMP, brought to you by DataLink. My name is Danielle Moore, Marketing Manager, and I will be your moderator. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. The webcast console you're looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. All questions from this webcast will be captured. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the question mark icon below the presentation window. This help guide covers common technical issues. I would now like to turn this over to our presenter, Jason Middlebrooks. Hello, and I wanted to welcome everybody today joining us on our topic. We're going to discuss how the integration of Net Backup and DNP type backups can be integrated in with the new NetApp cluster data on tap operating system. And when I say new, it's not like it's new as of yesterday. It's been around for a couple of years, but it, Net, NetApp made a transition from um, their seven mode operating system to cluster data on tap. So we want to cover the differences between the legacy seven mode systems and how you can actually integrate NetBackup and kind of the best practices to integrate uh, NetBackup NDP type backups with the new or the latest cluster data on tap operating system from NetApp. So first of all, what exactly is NDMP and net backup for NDMP? Well, it's something actually that's been around for quite a long time. It's like it was a it's based um, on the network data management protocol, which is a standard industry standard. Um, but it is a way to initiate and control backups and restores and recoveries of your network attached storage systems. And this is not just limited to uh, NetApp, but this is also available for other network attached storage systems too from other manufacturers. Today we're going to focus on NetApp simply because there was a shift and change in how it was configured between seven mode and cluster data on tap. So net backup for NDMP is basically, a, it can be viewed as an agent within net backup, but it's a way that net backup can talk to these network attached storage systems. Um, and it is supported for various NDMP protocol versions. So NetBackup supports version two, three, and four of the NDMP protocol version. Um, what we're covering today will have a focus simply uh, on uh, NetApp um, because of the differences between how it's configured, NDMP is configured with cluster data on tap versus NetApp seven mode devices, which were common two plus years ago. Let's cover some of the NDMP terminology. Um, when we say NDMP, that's just the protocol. That's a network data management protocol. That actually, that's a protocol that lives and exists on the network attached storage itself. Uh, NetBackup has the ability to hook into and read and utilize that protocol to move data for backup and recovery purposes. You have an NDMP client, and this is the NDMP client is actually the control host or the, the machine actually that controls the backup and restore of the NDMP host. The NDMP host is the actual network um, attached system or the, the NAS system that's actually serving the data. In other words, that's the system hosting your your NFS and SIS volumes, or even your fiber channel protocol volumes. Um, there's a mix. And when we talk specifically about yeah. NetApp, um, it can host more than just NFS and SIS, but it can also do block level one type of storage too. Net backup for NDMP server, that's actually your net backup master or media server on which the net backup for NDMP software is installed. So there's nothing you actually install on the NDMP host itself. So the NetApp system, there's no NetBackup client or agent or anything that physically goes on 
the NDMP host, which is our storage device, because that is using the NDMP protocol that's actually written for that particular storage device. So the NDMP is a functionality of the NetBack or the NetApp data on tap operating system. Some of the features of NDMP that's been around for quite some time is uh, what's called DAR or direct access recovery. That's the ability to, in a tape environment, to actually position the tape directly to the, the spot that needs to, you need to start reading data when, you, when you're when you going through a recovery process. It allows, it prevents you from having to read an entire tape to just get to a single file that you're trying to recover. Um, so that's actually a, a functionality of NDMP or a feature of NDMP, I should say. And then there's also another feature, NDMP direct copy, that allows you to directly copy a tape uh, or backup image from one tape device directly to a second tape device attached to the uh, network attached storage device. So in other words, you're not having to send the data over the network to some other server or some other tape device. That covers a little bit of the Indian NDMP terminology that's been around for this, like I said, this is not new, this has been around for, for a, quite some time. When we talk about NDMP backups, there are three different types of NDMP backups. There's what's referred to as a local backup. This is basically when you take a tape device and attach it to your um, NetApp storage device or your, your, net, net, your NetApp um, your network attached storage device, which in this case we're describing as NetApp. Um, and that data can travel straight from the NetApp straight to the tape device. That's a local backup. No data is sent over the network. You have your three-way NDMP backup. And what that is is where actually one NDMP host will send its data to a second NDMP host where the tape, drive, tape devices or virtual tape libraries tape devices are connected. The remote NDMP backup is, is actually becoming more of a common and standard way to back up a lot of these uh, NAS devices um, because there's a problem inherent to most NAS devices um, is you cannot you can only have tape devices directly attached to them for NDMP protocol to work. So what you have to do to do perform an NDMP backup, you actually have to send that data to a remote host. Um, which in a case would be a net backup media server that can then write the data to a disk device or a, or a tape device, any kind of storage device supported on that net backup host or media server. So you get the benefit of not having to use tape, but using a lot of the deduplicated storage devices um, via OST or media server dedupe pools by Veritas, which allows you to take advantage of many of the advanced features and functionalities to accelerate and speed your backups and recovery process up. So to look at those workflows a little in detail of those three three different types of NDMP backups, this is an example of a local workflow where you have an NDMP client, which is our net backup server on the left. It initiates It initiates a, a, the command and control to the NDMP server, which is hosting the data itself. That data is then in turn written to our tape device attached to that NDMP host, while the metadata is sent back to our net backup catalogs. The second method is a three-way backup. This is where we have our net backup client or net backup server on our left-hand side that initiates the command and control to an NDMP host that hosts the data we want to back up. That in turn sends it over the network to a, uh, to a, a second NDMP host over the network so it can write to its local tape device and while the metadata is sent back to the net backup server or in the net backup catalog. And the third method is our NDMP remote backup workflow. What we have is our NDMP client 
which is also our net backup media server on the left hand side it is attached to some type of tape storage and disk storage in this case or this example this is where you can get the benefits of the advanced functionality written, written within net backup the, the ndmp client sends the net backup or the ndmp command and control to the ndmp host which in turn sends the backup data over the network to our media server and can write to any storage device attached to the media server. So in this case, we're not limited to tape. Meanwhile, the, the metadata is still is sent over the network to the um, net backup catalogs. So that's our three methods of NDMP backups. That's kind of a high level overview of how NDMP works with Net backup and NetApp specifically. Um, that's been around, like I said, that's traditional. That's been around for a, a very long time. Many, many versions of both Net backup and uh, Data on Tap support that NDMP type of backup. Uh, what we did want to talk about now is NDMP support for clustered on Tap. Like I said, several years ago, two, three years ago, uh, NetApp introduced their clustered Data on Tap operating system which is a more of a scale out operating system and allows you to move data between those. I have examples that we're gonna see how that flow works. Um, but that also caused a challenge to do NDMP backups. If you had data that moved within your environment, then that backup only knew how to communicate it via one path. It did not know about a secondary path or another way to get to that data point. So your backups were actually fail until you went in and manipulated your backup policies to point to the correct location. So net backup support, support for clustered on tap basically extends your traditional NDMP model for backup and restores, and it basically includes a content or a cluster content awareness across your entire cluster or your net app cluster. Um, it allows you basically to optimize and get your data in what's now called container storage virtual machines and i'm going to help define that here in just a minute um, this 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 feature and functionality for clustered on tap support actually had to be written in the ndmp protocol first so that was done in netapp on tap or netapp data on tap 8.2 and later so it's an actual piece or an API of the version 4 NDMP protocol that's based on CAB or what's called cluster or where backup. So once NetApp wrote that API, then that backup had to turn around and then support it. So in version 7.6, they did not fully support the CAB API. It was fully supported in version 7.7 .7 going forward. So some of our NetApp terminology that those, if, if a lot of the people on the call are kind of backup administrators and, and more focused on backup and not familiar with NetApp terminology, it's very important to understand this terminology before we get into actually best practices and configuration of these type of backups. Um, you have your CAB cluster or backup. That's our API extension. That's part of the, our NDP protocol. You have what's referred to as CDOT or clustered data on tap. That's really the operating system on the NetApp itself. That's the operating system that runs the storage system. Um, going forward, you probably will not see CDOT mentioned much. It'll just be clustered on tap. That's the name they're going because there, there's no longer seven mode being developed. So seven mode was kind of the generation before CDOT or clustered data on tap. Um, so now it's all going forward being called clustered on tap. Within a clustered on tap system, you have what's called SVMs or V servers. They were first, when, when clustered on tap was introduced, they were first referred to as V servers or virtual servers. Many of your net backup command, I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me, many of your NetApp commands still use the word V server in the command line. Um, but they're also referred to kind of in presentations and talking points as storage virtual machines or SVMs. So in this presentation and many other presentations you may see about NetApp, when you see SVM, SVM is the same thing as a vServer. It's basically a virtual layer that includes volumes and lifts 
which we'll talk about lists in just a minute, um, within your clustered ONTAP environment. You have your lists. That's your logical interface. A lift is really just an IP address and a port that is hosted on a node within your NetApp dot system. A lift can also be tied to a fiber channel, worldwide name, but for this presentation and for the uh, talking points of ND and P support, you don't send data over the fiber channel, so we will not cover that the fiber channel lifts in this presentation. So in this presentation, we reference a lift or logical interface. The most important thing to realize is this really just truly an IP address that is hosted within your NetApp environment. You have several, basically four different types of lifts or lifts, logical interfaces. You have your node management lift. That's a dedicated IP address to each node in your NetApp cluster. You have a cluster management lift. That is a single management IP for the entire cluster that you use to manage your entire cluster. So that cluster management lift does not reside on a single node. It just it resides within your cluster. And you're going to see in just a minute how that IP can move around within your cluster. You have data lifts. That's a logical interface that's associated with a V server or SVM. Your data lift is actually your access point in for user access. So when a user access their SIFs or NFS, amount points or exports, that's the IP address they use. So as, is, as we talk today, you'll see that NetBackup can use that same data lift and move around within your cluster to access data. You also have what's called inter-cluster lifts. Those are on each node and are kind of dedicated for inter-cluster or node communication for um, some of the back-end processes. Um, NDMP does use those inter-cluster lifts for back-end communication. It's also used for snap mirror and snap vaulting within your NetApp environment. Let's look a little bit about the NetApp parts and pieces. In other words, when we talk about a NetApp cluster, what exactly are we talking about? Well, it starts off at a minimum, you have two nodes in your cluster. So this picture represents two nodes in a cluster. That you can have up to potentially 24 nodes in a cluster. But for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus just on a two-node cluster. Each of the nodes is a compute node, a compute head. So you have CPU, memory, flash cache, different things within of the, each of those compute heads. Those compute heads or those two nodes are in what's called an HA configuration. In other words, you have a pair. Anytime you, do, you scale your cluster out, you add HA pairs. Each HA pair can see a subset of disks. In other words, they share the same disk between an HA pair. On each node, we have our node lift. That's an IP address for node management. It's important to see that each node has a lift. By default, you have a cluster SVM or vServer that basically is, is a container across your entire cluster. That cluster SVM has a cluster of management lift that I talked about, as you see that shown up above. So as you start building out storage virtual machines or vServers, when you do that, you every time you build one, you assign some storage or volumes, flexible volumes to that SVM. And you also wanna assign at least one, actually two, IPs to the SVM, because best practice is to have a management lift, and then you start having data lifts. And you can have anywhere from one to 10 to many data lifts per SVM, but at a minimum, you're gonna have one. So you, each SVM should have two um, lifts associated with it. I'm just showing one in this example. Um, as you build, you build a second SVM, you dedicate some, some storage and volumes, and you assign another lift to that SVM. Now, what these lifts can happen to these lifts are they can move within your cluster. So if there's some type of failure or some type of event, those IP addresses can move from one port in your cluster to another port in your cluster. So this is where the support for your cluster or backup comes into play because you may access your cluster system at a different point than you did yesterday. 
today you may access access at a different path than yesterday. So it's important to understand how these lists can move back and forth. One thing to note, your node lists do not move. Only your cluster management and data lists can move within your environment. So when we talk about NDMP backup with clustered on tap, there are two different uh, modes of operation. You're still, the, remember we talked about your local three-way and remote NDMP types of backups? That still is applicable. That still applies in this case. But when we talk about with clustered on tap, there's actually two ways of setting up the support for NetBackup to, to talk to your NetApp clustered on tap system. The first one is your node scope mode. That's the way NDMP has looked for years. In other words, all your NDMP connections will be made locally each node or your node management list. And remember in that previous picture, we saw our node list does not move. So anytime an NDMP connection is made, is made to an individual node. Like I said, this is the way it's been done for, for years. This is the way it was done in seven nodes. You actually access each node independently of each other. So in 8.2, data on tap 8.2 and higher, you can switch that mode from node scope to SVM scoped or vServer mode. That's what it's commonly known as, and the command line actually shows it as vServer mode. That is something that you enable on the NetApp cluster itself. You don't have to do anything within Net Backup. It's simply a command on the NetApp cluster, the issue. And I'll show you that command in our lab that we're going to look at for the end of, end of the presentation. With vServer mode, your NDP connections are made either to two access points. You either make them into the cluster admin SVM, that lift, that cluster management lift. You make your NDP connection into your cluster management lift you will actually be able to access any and all volumes within the cluster. So any cluster hosted on any node within your cluster, you'll be able to see and back up. If you set up your NDP connection to access an individual SVM or V server, you're going to tell it to access a specific data lift. Remember that data lift can move around within your environment. You're actually going to limit your access only to the volumes hosted in that particular SVM or vServer. So it's a really good way to isolate and segregate your backups per SVM. The whole concept behind, behind SVMs on a clustered on tap system is for multi-tendency and the ability to separate your workloads and move your workloads within your NetApp environment. So being able to set up different policies and separate backup um, themes and policies and retentions Per SVM is a very flexible way to do your backups going forward within that backup. This chart kind of shows your different um, rules depending on how you're accessing, you know, what IP address or what lift are you accessing. Um, the key thing to take away from this is if you look at the node name, if you if you access the node, you have to be in node scope, road, uh, node scope mode, and you can only access the volumes and utilize the tape drives that are attached to that local node. So if for some reason a volume moves within your cluster, you'll, you'll have to change how you access it within net backup. So the rest of the chart shows your vServer mode access points. If you access the cluster management lift, you will be able to see all volumes on that node or all volumes in the cluster, depending on if you're using the CABAware backups or non-CABAware. So the difference in those two col columns, non-CABAware and CABAware, is strictly the version of net backup you're using. If you're using 7.6 or earlier net backup, you're going to be using the, the non-CABAware column. If you're using 7.7 .7 or higher, you would actually be taking advantage of the CABAware net backup support. So my recommendation is if you're wanting to use configure NDMP backups for clustered on tap, 
you would one want to be at data on tap 8.3, and I'm going to show you why in just a minute. And two, you would want to be at net backup 7.7 .7 or higher. Okay, let's talk a little bit about using tape drives for NDMP backups. I made this statement earlier where it's very common now where people aren't using tape drives necessarily for backups, um, simply because the, a lot of the advanced functionality is not available. Um, but if you are using tape drives to do your NDMP backups, um, you it, it takes advantage of the CAB extension and the NetApp C dot server uh, actually provides unique local location information of your volumes and tape drives. And that's, that's actually done in an Infinity database that's kept on the NetBackup master server. It's one of the EMM databases now. And that actually allows NetBackup to perform a local backup to its tape drives. In other words, if a volume resides on a certain node anywhere within your cluster, it's going to choose the tape drive local of that node to perform the backup. Um, but there's some some um, requirements for that. Uh, the tape devices must be configured to use the cluster management list as the NZMP host within your device configuration. That's the biggest thing there. People are used to configuring their tape devices on an NZMP storage host um, to be locally attached to that NZMP host, which would be a, a node in this case. So you would actually have to shift how you configure those tape devices not reference the node IPs or the node host names anymore, but the actual cluster IP and cluster host name. Um, all your nodes in your cluster that have access to tape devices should have access to all your tape devices. So some of the NetApp requirements is you need at least one inter-cluster lift on each node, that's required for your three-way and remote backups. Uh, data does not actually flow um, or come out of that cluster interconnect lift. That's a way for the nodes to talk to each other within the cluster. Um, infinite volumes, if you're using infinite volumes on your NetApp system, they are not supported for, for CAB aware or cluster aware backups and vServer aware mode. You would have to actually use um, they're, they're, you're very limited on those in infinite volumes because they can span multiple nodes. You're basically taking smaller volumes and creating a really, really large volume. So there's a lot of restrictions with those anyway. You need data on tap 8.3 for it, the support started in 8.2, but in 8.3 they added two um, kind of important things. They enhanced the browse capability in the NetBackup policy. That was actually there in 8.2. So they enhanced it in 8.3, and they also introduced wildcard support. You don't necessarily have to list out each volume. Um, you can actually do some uh, nice tricks with wildcards in your net backup policies. Um, what do I recommend going forward? I recommend the SVM scope mode uh, for greater control of what you back up, when you back it up, and where you back that data up to. That's going to give you the greatest flexibility backing up a NetApp system via NDMT. So I wanted to talk about NDMT and Accelerator. Um, a lot of times when you perform NDMT backups from a network attached storage device, um, you're actually having to back up a large amount of data, you know, SIF shares, NFS exports, uh, usually large volumes which takes a large amount of time to back up. So there's a feature in NetBackup 7.7.1 7 .7 that will help with the backup of those large data sets. This was actually introduced in 7.6 for um, VMware and for physical type server backups within NetBackup. But in 7.7.1, NetBackup introduced Accelerator for NDMP. And what Accelerator does is it actually reduces dramatically the backup window for these NDMP type backups. Um, it's simply as easy as uh, enabling a check box in the backup policy. It's truly that easy. As long, and then my statement there, but 
you have to be going and sending the backup to a supported net backup storage server or storage unit. In other words, you cannot be sending this type of accelerator backup to tape. It has to be either an advanced disk or MSDP pool or an OST type backup pool. And the vendor, if you're using OST, the vendor has to support the accelerator functionality. If they don't support it and you select the checkbox in the policy, the job will fail. Um, the key features of Accelerator is basically it accelerates a backup. What it's doing is just creating a track log. It's using the track log technology to keep up with what changing, what is changing at the block level, and only sending those change blocks for the backup. So when you enable Accelerator, you basically have your first full backup with Accelerator is no different than your normal full backup. It may take a little longer to run than our normal full backup um, because it's having to create that track log, the initial track log. But it does not really take much longer. It's just a, 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 just a slight bit longer. Um, your incremental backups with Accelerator, basically any incremental job after that full will only back up the changed data since the last backup job. And it's going to be at the block level versus the file level. Your next full backup with Accelerator is only it's going to look at the change block track, the change track log, and it's only going to send the change blocks during the backup process. But on the backup, the backup is going to create a new accelerated full or synthetic full within the net backup catalog. That way it thinks it backed up the full data set, but you actually only transferred what's changed. I have a graph and we're kind of showing this in just a minute. When doing accelerator backups, there's actually, um, when you include the option, all the data on the file are backed up. Um, the backup is uh, similar to the first full accelerator backup, but it provides a, a new baseline for the backups that follow. Um, so there's an option to set up a, a new schedule when you're doing accelerator backups in the schedule to basically say, and it's recommended at the minimum every six months to run what's called an accelerator force rescan. What that's going to do is when, when you run a full and for six months you continue to run accelerator backups, you may want to reset and kind of refresh that track log. So it's a good practice and recommended to every six months have a force rescan schedule set up. So you're actually rebuilding that track log. That new backup, that force rescan backup, will take a lot a while to move the data. It's just like doing a full backup all over again. That's why you don't do it once a week. You do it every six months or whatever year is appropriate for your environment. The track log, this is just a binary file that's, that's saved. Um, it's not a file you should uh, modify. It is a file that's used in troubleshooting sometimes um, if there is a problem with it. Uh, that file actually lives on the both the media server and the master server. So the media server that performs the backup has a copy of that track log along with the master server. If for some reason that backup um, goes to a different media server on a different day, that track log is copied to that media server also um, and taken off the original media server. The location of the track log is in the install directory um, slash db slash track. So depending on what your master media server is, you know, so Windows, that would be the install path of that track log. The important thing to kind of point out is the track, there's not a track log saved on the NDMP host. So your NetApp box is not actually keeping that NDMP tra or the track log. It's actually saved on your media server and master server. Unlike Accelerator, Accelerator for Net Backup clients in the standard world. 
Uh, there's a way to kind of view and look at your accelerator track log and see what the size it would be. Um, it depends on basically the number of files and the size of files. But there's a, that's an example of a formula to actually try to estimate that. When you start using NDMP accelerator type backups, you want to, uh, it doesn't use your dump levels like your traditional NDMP backups do. It actually uses a base date and dump date to compare those two as far as if it needs to be backed up or not. So it's a little different than your, if you've been using NDMP for a while, you realize that it uses basically a dump command on your NetApp filer. And when it does that, it, um, it, it looks at the level and see what, what has changed. It no longer uses that for accelerator backups, it uses the base date and uh, dump date. So if for some reason you have a policy, existing policies, and all of a sudden you want to enable accelerator, in other words, say you have introduced support for accelerator, in other words, a storage device that supports accelerator type backups, when you enable it, basically your incremental jobs will still do their incremental functionality until the next full, and then that next full would basically be like a forced rescan full. It's going to do an accelerated full. Once that accelerated full is done, all your incrementals going forward will be your accelerated incrementals, which will be just be backing up change blocks, not change files. So this is a picture of Accelerator. You see on the left, you have your, your filer, you have your file system. The green box kind of shows what's being changed. That, that change black, uh, that the track log is being copied to your master server along with your media servers. And your accelerator incrementals and fulls, where your incrementals are just going to get those change blocks in the middle there. When you do a new full, it's basically going to take that previous full, those new green blocks, and create a new synthetic full on the back end. That's all done within that backup in the catalog. So it's not actually having to move. So if it's a five terabyte file system and you only have, um, you know, several change blocks, you're not having to move that entire five, five terabytes for the, the next full. Okay, so that's an overview of NDMP, NDMP for clustered on tap and, and net backup for accelerator. So it's, let's actually look at what would need to be configured on your NetApp and your net backup environment and I actually have um, a demo we can show you um, this working. So on the, on the NetApp side, this is what you would need to configure. First, you would want to make sure that every node has an intercluster lift. If you're using tape, you would configure tape on each node. You would want to enable your vServer aware mode. You would then want to make sure your NDMP protocol is allowed on your storage virtual machines or your vServers. You then want to en enable NDMP on the storage virtual machines and vServers. You can set up preferred interfaces if desired. You'd want to make sure your firewall policy is enabled. In other words, you're not blocking NDMP type uh, backup traffic on certain networks. You'd either want to create a backup user or use the default users. The default users are admin and VS admin, depending on if you're doing a cluster, um, kind of a cluster level backup or if you're doing an SVM level backup. You'd need to generate passwords for net backup. These, this, these are all steps done on the NetApp, which I'm going to show you actually each of these steps. And then for some sub volume level wildcards, there's an advanced command you'd want to run and make sure there's an extension enabled set to true. And net backup, what is there to configure in net backup? You would want to create an NDMP host in net backup. For an SVM or vServer view, you would want to use that SVM data list. It may also be desirable to have a backup list or backup data list so you can separate your net backup, NDMP backup traffic from your actual user traffic. 
for a cluster view, you would use your cluster management list. I'm going to show you both of those. You would use the password you generated from the command on the NetApp filer. There's ways to test communication. This is These are kind of similar to what you've always been able to use to test NDP connections. Um, TP AutoConf test verify, and then you can look at the EMM database and see what flags are set for that NDMP host. You would create your tape devices as needed. You would create your storage units as needed. It's using, it's using tape or disk or whatever. Then you create your policies. And some of the things in the policies to point out is the policy type would be NDMP. You, to use Accelerator, you just check the box. Um, use multiple data streams to split the jobs up better. You'd want to create a forced rescan schedule every six months when using Accelerator. Um, for your client, in other words, what client are you backing up? That's either going to be your SVM or your cluster view client that you enter in as the NDP host. And then you would enter in the backup selection. Either type it in. The format would be slash B server slash volume slash you could actually go down to folder and file level. Um, or you can actually browse your volumes now, which is a very nice feature. Or you can use wildcards to get multiple things. So now I'm going to share my screen, and we're actually going to look at a lab. I have a, a live demo set up here. We're going to run through some of this. So in our lab environment, the things to point out, is we ha I have basically two different entry points I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to show you the cluster view, which our cluster um, is called E4 Net at 1C. Um, and I'm going to show you a storage virtual machine view or a vServer view. And what that is, is it's an isolated virtual container within my, in my entire cluster. Um, I have a master server. And in this case, I don't have any tape in my lab environment. Um, so there's no tape attached directly to the NDMP host, but I am sending this to a net backup appliance, which is a media server dedupe pool, which allows me to use the accelerator functionality. I can show you the benefits of that. Let me get logged into my NetApp file here, and then we can start this. Okay, so some of the things to look at on my the NetApp system is. I want to look at the what scope am I set, set for in this cluster. So in this cluster, my NDMP node scope is disabled. In other words, I'm using vServer scope or SVM scope. So I'm not going to reference any node names or IP addresses in my NetApp configuration. Then I would want to make I would want to look and see what protocols are support, supported. So for my SVM for our test purpose and demo, um, I see that I have my NDMP protocol is a supported protocol for this particular SVM. I'm then going to look and see if I make sure I have NDMP enabled for my v server. In this case, I see I have right here, I see NDMP is set to true or enabled for this particular v server. I'll see that I have a 
uh, my firewall policy for NDMP um, is actually, I don't have any restrictions there. I'm allowing any, any IP address to access NDMP in this environment. I then want to look at what users I have defined for my particular vServer. Um, in this case, I have VS Admin. That is the default user. I also have a net backup user I created. So if you create your own user for net backup to authenticate with, um, the role that that user would need to be in is backup. So as you see here, the role that this particular user is in is in the backup role. It needs certain rights to be able to do backup and recovery functionalities. You can also use the default vServer admin user here if desired. I would then want to generate a password. So if I wanted to use the default user, I would want to generate a password for that user. This is an encrypted password that we're actually going to use for our net backup access. So in this case, I would want to copy that password there, and that's the same password I'm going to use with the net backup. So switching to my net backup view, um, the first step is go under credentials in DMP host. And in this case, I have two different entries for NDMP host. I have my cluster aware or cluster view is my short one there, E4 NTAP 1C. And then I have my SVM view, which is E4 NTAP 1C and BU01. So if I double click on that, this is where I've set up the user and password. So if I was creating this, I would give it a name and then I would give it the credentials. So this is where I enter in that password that I got from the previous um, command on the NetApp device itself. So if I go to my policies, I have two different policies set up that I wanted to show you. So let's look at my SVM policy. Um, this is going to be basically the, uh, uh, the scope of this is going to be whatever data is within my SVM. So I have NDMP selected. Yeah, you, I have it going to a disk storage pool here. And the reason behind that is because I wanted to show you the accelerator functionality. Um, I use allow multiple data streams in this case. It's supported. You can have multiple streams. It's very good to back up your, uh, to, to segregate your backups into multiple streams so you can control them better. Um, and then you use Accelerator. This is where you turn Accelerator on or off, just that easy. For my schedules, I actually have three different schedules. I have a full, I have an incremental, and then I have my forced rescan. So if I look at that forced rescan schedule, remember this is when you set up about every, to run every six months or so. Um, here's the flag where you tell it to be a forced rescan. I do not have any automatic schedule set up for these jobs. These are just manual jobs for demo purposes. My client for this policy is my SVN scope, my SVM scope. In other words, I just, that NDMP host I entered in the previous step where I gave it that password, this is just going to see my SVM data. And if I tried to um, add a, a client in there, it's only going to give me what's listed out under my NDMP host. In other words, I can't type something in. I could actually add a new one here, and it's going to go and set up that NDMP host, and I'm going to have to provide the password, username, and password. For my backup selections, um, I actually have an example of a wildcard in here. To show you how a wildcard, this is going to get everything in this V server. Um, that has test as a volume name. Anything in test as a volume name is going to get the backup. So if I was to click on new here, 
I wasn't sure what to get. I can one type it in. You can use directives like new streams and whatnot too. Um, but I can also have the browse functionality. So this is nice, and a lot of people have been wanting this for a long time for NDMP type backups. It goes out there and actually looks and sees what's within this container that I could potentially back up. So it came back, and these are all the volumes located within this SVM. So since I'm using a wildcard here, I'm going to get this first one because it has test in it. I'm going to get the fourth one because it has the word test in it. Um, I will I'll, I'll actually get the third one also. Um, but it will not get this test volume because the test is actually, the wildcards are case sensitive, so it will not get that test volume in this example. All right, so let's start this job. And when we do a full job, it's going to run, it's going to kick off a parent job, which will spawn the, the children job, depending on the number of volumes I have listed in there, since I'm using allow multiple data streams. But what we want to do look at is we want to look at on the NetApp side, we can look at our, our status. And we see we have right now two backups, right? Okay, so there's our three backup jobs. Each one has a connection in to this node. The reason is connected into this particular node in our cluster. We look at where our IP address that we're accessing resides. This is the IP address we're accessing. When I enter it in that backup, this is the IP address we're accessing. Um, this is our management lift um, that we're using for the flow for our net backup data. We see that it's currently residing on O2B. And that's you can see that that showed where these particular connections were. So those should always match. So if we was to migrate this IP address from this node to another node in our cluster, because that IP can kind of float back and forth, we would then see this connection point being that node, even though we didn't change it, we don't change anything and in that backup itself. So if we look at our jobs here, um, this job it should be should be finished now. Be finishing up, I believe it was about 15 gigs in size. So it's finished up. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to what I want to do is migrate this IP address. So I'm going to migrate it to E4 and tap 1C02A. So I'm going to migrate it to a separate node. When I did that, I actually showed that that IP address is now on. Now it resides on the O2A node. So if I go back and initiate my backup, We'll do a manual backup. I'm actually going to select the forced rescan because I want it to run for, I don't want it to be accelerated yet. When I do that, I'm going to basically do another full backup. In other words, I'm going to have to transfer all the data I just transferred before. Now, if I look at my status, System services NDMP status. 
My previous connections were on the O2B node. Now they're showing in the O2A node. So that IP address moved for some reason. I manually moved it, but in, in another case, it may move because of a network cable error or a port error failure or a switch failure. We didn't have to change anything in that backup for that data to move. In other words, we're still able to back that data up. It's transparent to us. Um, it's just it's just coming out of a different node. It, but you know, it, it's coming out. The NDMP job is tagged to the other node, but the data is actually flowing out that same IP address we use. It just resides on a, on a separate node. So we'll let that job complete, and as soon as it completes, then we'll actually run another full. That's not a forced rescan, and we'll actually see the the elapsed time. So this backup, we're backing it up for a second time. The first time took roughly two minutes to complete. It's roughly 15 terabytes. I mean, 15 uh, gigabytes of data. Um, obviously, nothing has changed in there um, because I, I believe I've just put PDFs and a couple of um, install files in there but nothing's really changed now that, that job is completed once it finishes drops a connection we'll actually go in here and we'll do a manual backup it was still full Now we'll go to the activity monitor and look at this job with accelerator on. So quickly it can transfer the data because it shouldn't be transferring any new data. So we can see it's already says it transferred 15 gig. Last time of this, um, instead of two minutes, it was it's you know under a minute. It still has to do the client connects and disconnects and everything. So, but if we actually go in this policy and look at our detailed status, see right here that we'll see an entry right here in this line: accelerator sent. X amount of data and the optimization of it was 100%. So the only, so that's how how beneficial Accelerator is in large environments. As you see, if this was 15 terabytes versus 15 gigs um, and very static data, it really helps in doing um, long-term backups on a regular basis pulls and, and um, not having to transfer all the data points. The only other difference in my other policy that I wanted to point out is in this other policy, it is cluster aware. In other words, it's still a SVM scope mode, but I'm using the cluster SVM for the view into it. Everything looks the same. Um, I can still use Accelerator if I wanted to. Um, but what's different is my client is not my SVM, but it, the client is actually the entire cluster SVM. So this gives me the view to all volumes within the cluster. And the backup selection here now, as I can see, as I build up this backup selection, I can actually span SVMs or vServers. My first entry here is a volume in my SV server you saw in the previous backup. This is actually a separate SVM. E4 NTAP1C underscore SVM01 and a volume within it. So this policy right here would actually span across all your SVMs in your environment. And that's it for the demo.
So I wanted to thank everyone for um, attending and I hopefully it was beneficial and helped you understanding a little bit about um, how NetBack, NetBackup integrates with NetApp cluster data on tap. Thank you for attending today's webcast. An on-demand version will be available within two to three days. You will receive an email notification once the recording is available. Thanks again for participating today.